as we sing about God, our Heavenly Father, to God be the glory. If we will stand, if you're able, and let us join together on To God Be the Glory. He should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In light of Father's Day, this first means that a father should teach their child to act the way they should be, because they will live and act that way th that they were taught. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, help all fathers today to teach their children goodness, so that they may live with the goodness of God. Amen. As you remain standing, we're going to sing a song that is a special request, and it's so appropriate as we enter an election season. Faith in our fathers. It's because of our fathers that we have the freedom to worship today. And they were led by God, the Heavenly Father, as they established our country. So we need to be thankful for that as we sing praises to our Heavenly Father.
Okay, I have. I'll take anybody that wants to come down and listen to Miss Gretchen. Oh, I have one. I have my all-time favorite. Yay! Hey, everybody at home, can you wave at me? Don't me kiss? Okay. Do you know what today is? Father's Day. Yay! We have a lot of special fathers and grandfathers that we love. And you know what? I did not, I thought I'd have a Bible in my uh, seat, but I didn't. But I have a verse, and it is my favorite all-time special verse. It is John 3, 6. God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that who should ever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, what does that mean? Our Father in art in heaven. But who is our Father? It's Jesus, isn't it? And he lives in heaven. And he saved us, his son. Now, who was God's son? Jesus. And Jesus died for us, and then he rose, and then he is in heaven with our Father God. And you know what? My dad is in heaven, and my dad, I loved him, but he was a mess. But, you know what? He kind of was, but I loved him, and you know I was so proud of him. Right before he went to heaven to be with Jesus, he joined the Catholic Church, and the priest said, that he had the love of God in his heart, and I was so proud. Now, I helped deliver Father's Day presents yesterday, and it was so much fun. I got to see some people, and some I just left it at the door and ran away. Now, I want you to tell me, what does your daddy do for you? How does your daddy help you? He what? He helped you? Yeah. yeah. Daddies are awesome, aren't they? They play ball with you. They have a job that they have to go to to take care of you. Uh, what else do dads do? Oh, let's see. Sometimes, if you have a lot of girls, they might dress up. There's a commercial where the daddy is putting the daughter's putting eyeliner and lipstick on him, and he is dressing up because his daughter wants him to. Not because he probably wants to. So, this Father's Day, right now, if you're home. Now, I wish I could see through, but I can't. I want you to all give your dads a great big hug. Okay, one, two, three, give them a hug. And say, Mm, I love you. I love you. You're special. And you are. And let's have a great Father's Day and we honor our fathers. That means we are so glad. And you know what? All of you at home and here in church, I have one dad, I guess, I really think is special, and that's 
this one right here, John, he, I just think he is the top. He brings his boys to church, and they all know who God is, and now he, he had one that came up and did the uh, reading this morning, and I'm so proud of him. And you know, a lot of you at home are special because you're bringing your kids up to be good Christian men and women. And that is very special. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, we are so glad that we have you in our life. And any time we need you, we can go to you and ask for prayers. Today, we ask to pray for those who are sick, who need you, and for all these wonderful fathers. We ask you in your name's sake. Amen. Okay. All right. You ready? Please continue to guide us in our daily actions. Bless these tithes and offerings and help us to use them to further your word and help those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many lessons that I've learned on my way They've given me a better understanding How to reach out to that poor old boy that strayed And I can take these hard knocks They can teach somebody Where I'm going, where I've been if I can reach that where soul and point him to heaven, 
Or maybe help someone avoid Thank you, Ronnie Bond. The only thing wrong with that song is it wasn't long enough. They need to add another verse, don't they? Well, if you haven't figured it out by now, it's Father's Day. And uh, we are so blessed to be in our Father's house to celebrate uh, with one another as we celebrate our Father in heaven. Uh, this morning, I want to... Uh, take a break from our lectionary journey through the Gospel of Mark, and I would like to share with you, uh, I think, a very pointed message, not only for fathers living in the present world we face today, but for the families uh, uh, that are struggling in this present world. I, I want to say this this morning. By divine design, the family is the nucleus of God's design. You put families together, and you have the family of God. So if, God, if Satan wants to attack the church, little wonder his first aim is at the immediate family. Fathers, mothers, if you want to protect your children from the enemy's attack, build your house upon the rock. This world will offer you many lures, but I promise you, it's all sinking sand. This morning, I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn over to the writings of Paul there in Ephesians chapter 5. We will find the beginning of our text this morning, but we're going to run all the way down into the first four verses of chapter 6. As you take your time this morning, as you find your passage, uh, for those who are able, I invite you to stand in reverence to the Holy Word of God as we share together. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 25. I hope you got your steel toe shoes on, guys. Here we go. You ready? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it. Skip down, if you will, to verse 28. So ought men to love their wives, even as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourished it and cherished it, even as the Lord the church." 
For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And fathers... Provoke not your children to wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Will you join me as we ask the Lord's blessing upon the reading of the Holy Word of God. Father, on this special Father's Day, help us to open our eyes to your Holy Word. Help us to be receptive of what you have prepared for us to hear this day, that you might find us as we gather. You would welcome us as your children, but then, Lord, you would correct us as we need to be corrected, that you would comfort us as we need to be comforted. You would challenge us as we need to be challenged, and you would transform us as we need to be transformed. Father, there be one within the sound of my voice today that knows you not as Lord and Savior. Again, we continue to pray for the day of salvation and the growth of your kingdom, that you might be exalted, that you might be praised, that you might be glorified, because you and you alone are worthy. Hear our prayer through your Son, Jesus Christ, we do ask. Amen. And amen. I shared this story a couple of years ago, and upon special request, I will share it again this morning. But apparently, there were three small children who stood in the kitchen desperately trying to convince their mother that the straight puppy uh, that just happened to wander into their yard needed a home. Please, mommy, can we keep him? We'll feed him. We, 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 we will clean up after him. We promise. And against her better judgment, Mom finally relented, and the children named the puppy Danny. For the next few weeks, Danny became a source of love and laughter to his new family, but with time, the children forgot their promise. And so... Mom began a search for a new home for Danny. Once the new home was secured, Mom gathered the children to break the news. And to her surprise, the children seemed to have very little reaction. In fact, the oldest oldest child simply said, Okay, Mom, if you say so, but won't we miss him? I'm sure we will, Mom said, but... He's just too much work for one person. And since I'm the one that has to do all the work, I say he goes. Now the other two children chimed in. But what if he didn't eat so much, Mom? Or what if he wouldn't be so messy? Could we still keep him, please? Mom held her ground. No, it's time to take Danny to his new home. And immediately all three children burst into tears. Danny, they cried. We thought you said Daddy. I'm not really trying to be funny this morning, although laughter can be a very healthy thing. My real purpose for sharing that story is I feel as a society, we have lost perspective of the father in the home. Gone are the days of father knows best or my three sons. Lost to us are the parenting skills of the Andy Taylors. 
If you think about it in our present day depictions, if fathers are even present in the home at all, often they are made out to be a source of ridicule or an object of shame and disgrace to the family. And the result is homes without fathers and men without any godly concept for being a father. This Father's Day, I want to intentionally share four biblical truths to help define God's expectation for the righteous father in an unrighteous world. Let's begin this morning, if you will, with what may be the most universal understanding of the father's role. Father as provider. From the very beginning of human civilization, it has been understood the father's role is first to provide for his family. As society has evolved, the family unit has suffered whenever fathers have allowed this responsibility to gravitate to either extreme. The father who gets lost in his work may prove to be a good provider, but other responsibilities of fatherhood will always suffer. And I don't even have to mention the pains that are inflicted upon the family by the father who refuses to work. The Apostle Paul plainly states, the righteous father's responsibility to provide. In his letter to Timothy, Paul wrote, and this is 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those in his own house, he has denied the faith. The point is, every man, I'm not mincing words this morning, folks, Every man has a biblical obligation to provide for his own family. A righteous father will do his utmost to ensure his wife and his children have all the necessities of life, a home in which to live, food to eat, clothes to wear. But Scripture also teaches there must be a balance. In, in, in meeting present societal demands, I think sometimes we have a tendency to push too hard to provide stuff. And in doing so, I think we have often presented an unbalanced picture to our children. The result, in my opinion has been, for the most part, the birth of a materialistic, unappreciative generation. The truth is, there's just a lot of kids growing up today who will never realize that you got to work, you got to earn, you got to save, and yes, sometimes you actually have to wait before some of the good things in life come to you. I say this almost as an apology to the young people who are listening to my voice this right now because it's my generation who's responsible for creating a generation with very little appreciation for hard work and therefore may be robbed of the joys that will come from dedication, aspiration, and achievement. As our example, the Heavenly Father is the ultimate provider. We know that. One of the best biblical examples I could find for that comes from the story in Exodus. You might remember when the children of Israel were wandering and lost out in the wilderness and they cried out to their Heavenly Father. God provided the manna, literally raining bread down from heaven. But remember, it was just enough for each day. Every morning, the people would have to go out and gather. And God didn't put it in their baskets for them either, folks. They still, even though God provided, they still had to get up and go to work. 
second. Let's be honest this morning. In an unrighteous world, families sometimes crumble. Relationships are sometimes severed. But hear this. A righteous father will love his wife. One of my favorite all-time quotes comes from Coach John R. Wooden, who said the greatest gift a father can give his children is to love their mother. The greatest gift a father can give his children is to love their mother. And our selected text for the morning, the Apostle Paul supports that very statement with very explicit instructions. Paul wrote, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Taken seriously then, this establishes the very criteria for which a husband's love for his wife should be measured. It's the very same love Christ holds for his bride, the church. Right there, I want images of Good Friday to pop in your heads, guys. And I ask, is there a greater love? And let me say this, guys. I, I, I know I'm, I'm being pointed this morning, but let me say this. Jesus doesn't just love the church when it's convenient. Jesus doesn't just love the church when she smells good or she looks good or she acts right. The love of Jesus knows no, no beginning and more importantly, it knows no ending. And that's the level of love necessary to hold families together and intact. In fact, I will go as far to say in every situation where there is a broken family, it always begins with one person placing personal wants, feelings, or desires before the wants, needs, and feelings of others. Maybe that's why Paul described God's intent for the Christian marriage with these directions. Don't miss this. He said, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself. So there we have it. God's instruction for the happy home requires very simply that each, both parties, both husband and wife, love each other even as their own self. And I want to say, go home and try that for a while, folks. See what kind of transformations start happening within the home. God's instruction. And what about children? Surely being a righteous father requires dealing with children, right? Look at chapter 6. Here Paul gives us direction not only to the fathers, but also to the children as well. So I want, I want to challenge every young person listening to me today. I want you to listen close. In verse 1, Paul begins by saying, Children, obey your parents. And here's the part parents sometimes forget to add. They like to obey your parents. That's not biblical, folks. What is biblical? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. What's he saying? He's saying that if, that, 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 that if parental direction is given from the direction of the Heavenly Father, it's in your best interest. This statement sounds so simple, and yet, let's face it, in this present world with the chaos all around us, it's so rare to see it in practice today. You know, there was a time when the word rebellion was reserved to describe the maturing teenager preparing to strike out upon their own, right? But not anymore, folks. Today, rebellion seems to begin at a much earlier age. 
And I want to say this morning, what every mother, son, or daughter needs to hear is no matter your age, from 0 to 65, I don't care. This is God's direction for you. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Why would Paul make such a blanket statement? Well, let me try it this way. First of all, not only are our parents older and wiser, but when their life is centered and built upon the Christ, their compassion is unlimited. Christian parents always, Christian parents always give direction intended for our betterment. Amen? I love the line from, uh, anybody listen, Brad Paisley? Have you heard the letter to me? I love the line he said, uh, each and every time you have a fight, just assume you're wrong and dad is right. Wow. I wish I'd had that wisdom when I was much younger. Second, if you think about it, if our goal as parents is to raise children responsible unto the Lord, this is very practical apprenticeship for living the Christian life. Christian servanthood is actually, basically, very simply, folks, it's two steps. Christian servanthood is basically two steps. First step, seeking God's direction. Second step, following it. Doesn't get any simpler than that. So it, 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 at some point in our life, if we are going to learn to follow Jesus, then we all must learn to obey. This concept of obeying the Heavenly Father always comes to us much easier when we are in practice of following the direction of our earthly fathers. See how that works? But fathers, understand this. That puts some pretty lofty responsibilities squarely upon our backs, doesn't it? Watch what it says. This instruction uh, uh, Paul, Paul says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, as we unlock this text, what I would say is Paul can best be understood as we look at the two key words employed, nurture and admonition. To begin with, let us suggest that the word nurture may have been better uh, uh, translated with the word training. The point being is the word indicates raising a child is not something that just happens. It's a process. It will require your presence. But more than just your presence, it will require your attention. You know, it's possible to be present and not pay attention. Gulp. Some of you didn't even realize that was aimed at you right now. It's possible to be present and not pay attention. But let me say this this morning. Children always grow best when they're seasoned with a little patience and a whole lot of love. Amen? With the word admonition, Paul is referring to sound Counsel. He's referring to wise instruction. Thus watch, the expectations placed upon the righteous father then are to discipline his children with love, never in anger, and to teach him the ways of the Lord. I could not have done a better translation of our invocation verse than you did this morning, Carter. Spot on. Train up a child in the way he should go. Teach him Jesus. Teach him Jesus. And if you instill Jesus, the promise is he'll always know the direction as he grows. 
Teach him, Jesus. Finally, I've often said for any man to be all God desires, it starts with being the spiritual leader in one's own home. For any man to be all God desires him to be, it starts with being the spiritual leader in their home. Children look to their fathers for examples to emulate. And I want to assure you this morning, righteous examples or not, we will provide all the examples they will ever need. So for this reason, it's imperative that our words and our actions need to mix and match. One of the lines my mom used to use all the time, never worked, do as I say, not as I do. How does that work out, folks? I want to say this morning, if we love God and we strive to lead godly lives, the odds are much greater that our children will desire to lead godly lives also. But when we tell our children things like, you know, a relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important decision you will ever make, and then we sporadically participate in the life of church, the child's going to figure out pretty quickly that God really isn't uh, as important as we seem to say he is. Or if we tell our children that honesty and keeping our promises are important and then we fail to keep our word, or we, here's the one, if we chastise our children for the selection of their vocabulary when they're only repeating the words that came from our mouths. I'm just saying, folks, sometimes... Our actions speak much louder than our words. Being the spiritual leader of your home begins with a love of God, a growing knowledge of the Word of God, and its evidence as we live in right God and then with family. Even if we're presently admired in this unrighteous world, even as things look chaotic all around us, folks, we cannot fix everything out there. But I promise you this morning, whatever is happening in your life, if you will seek the direction of God the Father, if you will strive to live under His direction and lead your family in that direction, you can fix the problems in your home. Sometimes we're so worried about fixing everything out there that we don't see what's inside here crumbling apart. Even in the midst of an unrighteous world, hear this, God's expectations for Christian fathers has never changed. So here are the criteria our Lord establishes for the Christian father. You ready? First of all, to love the Lord God with all your heart. That's the starting point. To love one's wife more than self. To love his children and to raise them, to train them in the ways of the Lord. And in doing so, the righteous father will balance being provider, lover, nurturer, and spiritual leader within the home. As we prepare to close this morning, our question of invitation is really a simple one. How you doing? How you doing? All the wives reach over and elbow their husband. Let's do it this way, too. How you doing being the Christian father? With the same breath, how you doing being the Christian mother? Or even that, how you doing being a child living out a heart for the Lord? Oddest question this morning, folks. Can we get serious with God? 
What's the spiritual health within your own home? Is God really first? If not, maybe you just need to take a moment this morning. Just take time and pray for your family. I don't know, whatever the need. It's my experience that each and every day, the Heavenly Father waits eagerly anticipating conversation with you. That's our invitation this morning. You can come to the altar. You can bow your heart right where you're at. Whatever the need in your heart this morning. It's Father's Day. Can you just tell your Heavenly Father how much you love him and how much you need him? Or maybe, like me, there was a few things you had to uh, you had to get right with the Lord this morning before you could even come to worship. We all have those moments. Will you take time this morning? After all, it's Father's Day. Normally, we stand and we sing the final hymn. Today, I'm just going to ask you to sit and prayerfully just pray. Jane, would you do a solo for us for our hymn of invitation while we all take time to visit with the Heavenly Father? Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in His bosom gather, nesting bird, no star in heaven, such a stand to be dismissed a word on any heart before we go all hearts clear all minds clear on this Father's Day may we take time to honor our Heavenly Father as we emulate the love he's poured out upon us by intentionally sharing his love one to another. Fathers, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is the first commandment with promise. What was the promise? That you'd live well and live long. Hear the word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.